Thank you very much. All right, so here's the situation. So far, in the year of our Lord, 2010, it's been a good year for documentaries, right? Yeah. You got uh, a Casino Jack and the United States of Money. You got Client Nine coming out. Got a lot of good documentaries. Tillman Story. Got Tillman Story, which, which will Film win the Oscar. Finished. Film Unfinished, which is great. Yeah. But I'll tell you something. I watched this uh, documentary here. Who is Harry Nilsson? It's right here. And why is everybody talking about him? Because Harry Nilsson, it turns out, is a really interesting guy. Fascinating. And the producer of the uh, documentary is here. David Leaf is right here. Now, before we bring him on, yes. we want to show you a clip from the movie. Who is Harry Nilsson? Roll it. Everybody's talking at me I don't hear words they're saying Only the echoes of my mind So when you say Harry Nielsen, everybody says, no, Harry Nielsen, either they, they get it right away or they have no idea. Gotta get up, gotta get out, gotta get home before the morning comes. What if I'm late, gotta be day, gotta get home before the sun dialing a telephone, I got a busy signal, and it was going beep, 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 and just wrote it on the beep, phone. Beep. One is the loneliest number that you'll ever do. He just came on the scene, you know, blasted onto the scene, and he just started influencing people. I'm sure he influenced the Beatles as much as the Beatles influenced him. Nielsen's my favorite group. The Beatles endorsed Harry. Pronounced him to the world and said, listen to this man. I thought to myself, this song really has the potential to be like a little animated cartoon. So I said, why don't you try using different voices? Think of the doctor saying, now let me get this straight. You put the lime in the coconut. Put the lime in the coconut, you drink them both up. Put the lime in the coconut, you drink them both up. While we were in Japan, the nominations had come out. Album of the year, record of the year. Best Male Vocal Performance, Best Engineered Record, whatever category it could have been nominated, it was nominated. Love is not a disease, it's a measure, each day was a pleasure, each night is an adventure, each morning was something that had to be shared together. He spent most of his life in pursuit of a good time, and he caught it, and uh, it caught him in the end. I defer, Harry. Man, I don't know how far you want me to go with this. David Leaf, hey. everybody, Thank come you. on! Thank Give it up for him, the producer of Who is Harry Nilsson. By the way, this documentary is fantastic. Thank terrific. You. Thank you. Know? you. Really terrific. And what I love about documentaries like this is it takes a guy who you don't know that much about, right? A guy who had the one hit. You know, he sang the song from Midnight Cowboy, and that's really all you know about him in a sense. And then you watch a film like this, and you realize he had, he was so influential. He wrote all these other songs you didn't know about. You know, how much did you know about him going in? Well, I, I knew a lot about Harry uh, before we started making the movie because in a lot of the other documentaries I'd, I'd made and a lot of the other work I'd done, um, I have a whole separate career in music television series like uh, Live by Request or the Billboard Awards or all sorts of music specials. Uh, and my favorite people to work with are always songwriters. Because to me, songwriters are the ones who are kind of touched by God and, or whatever spirit you believe in. And they, they hear it and then they give it to us. And mm. if, if it hits you hard, it's like falling in love. And, and Harry Nilsson was one of those guys that so many people who I was working with always talked about as a friend, a colleague, somebody whose career they really admired. And, and the more uh, stories I heard about him, the more, I, I, the more we knew that this was a character who, who had, a, had an arc, a tragic arc, but, but an incredible story that nobody knew. Uh, and we've really only got to the tip of the iceberg of it in the, in the film. But uh, Nilsson is really just one of those Nobody knows who he is, and the moment you hear his voice, you go, oh, that's the guy. Yeah. Do you, do you feel like his career actually was not as big as it should have been? Um, it seems that Harry Nilsson was quite determined not to have a big career. He, he, he essentially is the textbook example of how to both not be successful and how to self-destruct at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, he... And, and this, was, this uh, as this is a movie show, I'll use a, a strange movie analogy. 
I think in, in my amateur psychological analysis of it is that it came so easily to him. He opened his mouth and this voice came out. He sat down at the piano and these songs came out. And so I think he didn't think his talent was worthwhile because it came so easily to him in the same way that maybe Brando didn't make good decisions because how hard can this be? Do you, do you think because he came he came of age at a time when artists could do that today in the music industry everything is so prepackaged so pre-marketed so designed so fabricated would he, he there would be a place for him today I mean that was such a unique era I, I there's always a place for a great songwriter I mean, but would he would he would he have found his voice today or would he have been sort of crushed by the machinery that that has become the the music industry today. Well, in the, in in the sense in a sense the, the the machinery that was the music business then gave him the tools that yeah. allowed him to crush himself. Interesting. Uh, I mean, he was successful. Uh, his biggest album had had a song called "Without You." Can't live if living is without you. And and he didn't write that. He didn't write everybody's talking. So his two most well known biggest hits he didn't write which for a songwriter is one, one of the, the strange ironies, and his life abounds with them. Um, but, but essentially, the success he had gave him the ability to drink and drug as much as he wanted to and avoid work. Right. But that was also a product of that time. You know, it's funny, like, when, 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 you, when you look at songwriters who flamed out in the 60s and 70s, it seems like they flame out in a different way than, than music stars flame out today. You know, back then, it just seemed so much, I mean, just such drunken diving off of hotels and just doing cocaine everywhere. It, somehow, it seems like it's different today. I don't know why. I'm not sure whether it's because um, it's, it's just a different culture or pop music is different now. There's different types of people who, who are on the forefront of pop music, and they sort of, uh, they kind of work out their vices in different ways. Maybe they... I, I think that the great artists of every generation, of every genre, of every artistic media do a lot of crazy stuff, and the question is whether they're going to survive it. I mean, I've made films about James Brown, John Lennon, Brian Wilson, the Bee Gees, uh, Sinatra, and, and there's, a, there's a lot of commonality in what happens with what Barry Gibb of the Bee Gees called first fame. Hmm. Can you survive it? Because it twists your mind and, and gives you opportunities to screw up in ways that you can't imagine until you are that successful. And so how did, and so specifically how did Harry screw up? Once he had that first fame, what just what did he do? What was his reaction the to? The success uh, he, he he disregarded it. He refused to tour. He almost never appeared live as a performer. He did a few television appearances and and, and some promotional uh, perf performances, but essentially was never a live performer. And he, he had, to my ear, perfect pitch, and so it wasn't, he wasn't somebody who could, um, who was worried about how he was gonna sound mm -hmm. and would have to lip sync. It wasn't, it wasn't anything like that. He had had a terrible experience early in his career where an audience had basically just kind of laughed at he and his partner when they were doing Everly Brothers songs early on. And when he had success as a songwriter, it gave him enough of an income that he didn't have to tour. And what uh, there's, a, there's a scene in the movie, very very well put together by, uh, by the director, uh, John Scheinfeld, and the editor, uh, Pete Lynch, where a whole bunch of his contemporaries, colleagues, and friends explain why he never performed. And, and his, his, his widow, Una, introduces, well, there are a lot of interesting theories as to why Harry never performed live, and then, then we see this montage of them. But essentially, he didn't, because he didn't have to. Uh, he, there was nothing perform in, in performing live that would give him anything that he needed. And then who were, because you, in, in the movie, he had a lot of famous friends, including John Lennon, which yes. I thought was amazing. So, you know, you get somebody, they become famous, and, you know, mm -hmm. not to compare him to someone like Lindsay Lohan, but a lot of it becomes who's around you to pull you back mm -hmm. from your worst impulses. Did Harry, uh, you know, watching this, you know, Harry didn't really maybe have that person. That's that's a, a really good point. He, he most definitely not only didn't have that person, but if someone like that appeared, he would drive him away. He wasn't, he wasn't gonna tolerate anyone telling him what to do in any way, shape, or form. Uh, perhaps the most painful interview we did for the film was with his second wife, 
uh, the one he divorced right at the height of his of his of his big fame in the early 70s and she we did the interview in 2005 this is 30 something years after they'd been divorced and it was as, it, the pain was etched on her face as if it had happened the day before she had not survived her experience loving and, and living with Harry Nilsson because she couldn't stop him mm -hmm. and his friends couldn't stop him, his famous friends couldn't stop him. Some of them enabled his excesses, some of them walked away from him when, when he was behaving excessively and, and others uh, uh, shook their heads and, and cried at what they saw, but nobody could stop him. Tell, tell us about, because it's so interesting, uh, about Harry's father and how, first of all, tell us a story about how Harry discovered his father and also how you think maybe that fed his personality growing older. Having a father, losing a father, having, getting him back. Tell people the story and then kind of tell how you think that falls into Harry's personality. Uh, Harry was abandoned when he was a, a little boy. Um, I mean, one of his most beautiful songs is called 1941. And it's in, the lyric is in 1941, a, a father had a son. In 1944, hmm. that father walked out, right out the door. So he was abandoned by his father. His mother was quite a, a larger-than-life character, and, and he ended up living uh, in a very strange world with a big extended family. And at some point in his teens, uh, one of his relatives said, well, you're not going to be able to live here anymore. We just kind of can't afford you and your appetite. We can't, and, and he was, so he was abandoned, re, he mm. found himself an abandoned child repeatedly. And so he had, with all, you know, the kind of psycho babble we put in, on our characters, he, he just was on his own. And, and that's the way he stayed. Um, the first son that he had with his, with his second wife, he abandoned also. Wow. And the boys in the movie, and he talks about the irony of Harry's life reflecting his his own as a child, and then as a father, he has a three-year-old son, and he gets a divorce. Um, he and his father did connect. But he thought later his, father on his father. He thought his father was dead. He he'd been told his father was dead, and all of a sudden, dad shows up alive, not only alive but with a new wife and uh, new children. And so it, it's there's a movie. In it's that. like a yeah. It's a it's, it, 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 there's a lot of movies in Harry's life, yeah. and unfortunately, none of them are really happy movies. Um, it, it's it's really it's a tragic story of wasted talent. It, it, it's a, it's a story of excess and self destruction, which makes it a great story yeah. for us as filmmakers. But unlike the U.S. versus John Lennon, or the night James Round Save Boston, or Beautiful Dream, or Brian Wilson and the Story of Smile. There's no happy ending here. Yeah. I mean, it's really, it's really. And it, le it leaves you with a lot of regret too, because you, as with so many artists, you know, Buddy Holly and, and many others who died before their time, you think, what could he have done if he had had just another two, three, four, five years? Well, I don't, I don't feel that in this case. There's so there's much, well, it, had he not sort of imploded uh, as he did? Well, he he had. I mean, one of the one of the most horrifying sequences that you can imagine as a as a singer with that kind of voice. There's a scene in the movie where where we hear his friends and colleagues talk about Harry and John Lennon getting into a screaming battle in the studio. Who could shriek the loudest? Oh how. Silly. And and as one of them describes, it didn't end until Harry's blood was on the mic screen. And he never really recovered from that, this beautiful, beautiful voice. He destroyed his instrument no. purposely, uh, per Richard Perry, who produced his most successful album. He said, Harry had a death wish. He says, I'm not sure why. He said, it took him 20 years to carry it out. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it's it's really... It's kind of a lesson in what not to do with your talent and your success. Now, there's a, uh, just going behind the scenes, there's a lot of amazing interviews you lined up for this. I mean, Brian Wilson and Mickey Dolenz. I love Mickey Dolenz. Ooh. Mickey Dolenz, Dolenz, everybody. Yes. Um, you know, <coughs> oh, wait. Wade will love this. Wade, you've, you've seen it. You know what I'm talking yeah. about? Mm -hmm. Paul Williams. Mm -hmm. How happy were you when Paul Williams Very showed up? happy. We are just Big kids Paul of, Williams fans. <laughs> we grew up with all that Paul Williams stuff. By the way, it's love true. Love soft as an easy chair. <laughs> 
We've only uh, just begun. Those, are, those are your songs. Yeah. Uh, Randy Newman, Brian Wilson. Yes. I mean, it's amazing. I mean, how did you did you find that these people were uh, were easy to get? Were they easy to book? Were they into the project? Did they have to be coerced, paid? I, I think I think w what's gotten easy for us over easier for us over the years because nobody really wants to sit in front of a camera and talk about their dead friend. I mean, that's yeah. just not fun. As much as they loved him, it, it was painful to kind of dredge up some of the, the memories of, from the questions we were asking. But what, what we've been able to do in, in the 15 years we've been making these documentaries is earn the trust of the artist, artistic community so that if we say to a, a Randy Newman or, or, or whomever, we're doing this, will you participate? Mm -hmm. They can look at our work and go, okay, they're not gonna exploit Harry, this isn't going to be behind the music. Really? Uh, so, did, so now, when you say that, I know you're just sort of saying it, but what, is there something about behind the music that you felt that you know? Because you, you you saw those shows. We pitched this to behind the music, and they didn't buy it. Really? I mean, it was it was it, it was very strange. I, I mean, it, the the process was we're sitting there and we're going, we've got a a story for you. It's going to have the Beatles and Monty Python and Robin Williams and Dustin Hoffman, Randy Newman, and on and on and on. And they sat for what is it? And we go, Harry Nilsson. And they'd go, who is Harry Nilsson? And so that's really Rangers where Idol. the name <laughs> came from. Who and there been there was a movie that Dustin Hoffman made, who was Harry Kellerman. Yeah. And was right after I think Midnight Cowboy. And Midnight Cowboy was where everybody's talking. So it's like, okay, the wheels are turning. Who is Harry Nilsson and why is everybody talking about him? Mm. And uh, as Tommy Smothers says in in the movie, you either know right away who he is or you have no idea who he is. Well, he he has a funny story in the, in the movie about um, about the Smothers Brothers had a comeback concert, and John Lennon and Harry showed up to the concert, and you know you can continue the story. Well, the 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 the, the euphemism for John Lennon's sixteen or seventeen months in, months in Los Angeles is the Lost Weekend. It's a very long Lost Weekend of of debauchery, really, and uh, Harry was the perfect partner for that until even John got tired of of it and went back to New York. Uh, but they would go out and get blasted. And one of the places they would go to was uh, the Troubadour. And uh, the Smothers Brothers were making their big comeback appearance. They had been, uh, it's hard to imagine today, but in the late 60s, the Smothers Brothers were radical television hosts. They were doing shows that got them literally thrown off CBS just for presenting song, singer-songwriters like Pete Seeger. I mean, it was, it's, it's almost inconceivable that they could be viewed as the enemy, if you will. And so this was their comeback show in Los Angeles. The Smothers Brothers are back in show business. And as, as Tommy Smothers says in the movie, he says, our act depends on s spaces, on beats. It's, it's, it's a comedy performance that requires a lot of silence. And of course, Harry Nilsson was, how many, however many sheets to the wind he was that night, he says, John, they don't like silence. So whenever, whenever, there, whenever there's quiet in the act, shout something out. And they did, and they, they got thrown out, and there was a big brawl. And it's, it's wow. just the, one of those legendary, ugly Hollywood stories. As John Lennon even says in the movie, he says, you know, when Errol Flynn and the old Hollywood movie stars would do that, it was colorful. He says, I do it, and I'm, you know, a bum. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, sh it shows how, how influential and popular he was, that he had all these famous people he would hang out with. These are, these are musical geniuses who don't hang out with people who don't bring it. His, his peers, Jimmy Webb, Randy Newman, uh, Van Dyke Parks, Brian Wilson, all the people who were part of the, the great L.A. singer-songwriter world of that time, um, they admired Harry tremendously because they knew how talented he was. I mean, from the first solo album on, it was obvious how talented he was. Here, here's a question, too, about all these artists. Is, could he have been who he was? Could he have been that talented if not for his vices? Did his vices inform his talent? Did his vices destroy his talent? Or is it a little bit of both? I don't... I, I mean, he he talked about one song that he wrote on an acid trip, um, so it's it's hard it's hard to and believe me, a lot of great songs have been written on on one pharmaceutical or another, uh, so it, it's a it's a fair question. Uh, I I think most of his great work would have happened without, yeah. uh, without being under the influence, and so the damage was much much more severe than than the benefit. Mm. So now uh, you've got the DVD. The DVD includes deleted scenes. Yes, w one of the great things about DVD for us, w when it came along, was 
because you're sitting in the editing room and if you're on a, if it's a television slot you got to lose something or even it's theatrical take it out it's too long and when DVD came along we just put it in the bonus yeah. section and, and it, it kind of saved a lot of fighting in the mm -hmm. editing room it was mm -hmm. it was a it was a good thing and and Harry inspired the kind of stories that couldn't be told in in short sound bites and Jimmy Webb who is an incredible storyteller and, and one of Harry's two best friends Ringo Starr being the other one uh, tells these amazing stories about Harry coming over and borrowing, saying, can I borrow your car? And then four days later, calls from New York. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, you know, by the way, I wrecked the car where I'm having it shipped back. Uh, and, but you, those aren't stories that you want to hear like that. You want to, you want to hear the full, I mean, they're, yeah. they're like, kind of like Irish folk tales. And so we've got a lot of those and, and, and a lot of other very enjoyable uh, tales of yeah. uh, Harry tales. We, we literally could have made a movie of just everyone telling their favorite Harry story and it would have been entertaining. Yeah. Yeah. And in a sense, that's what the, the bonus material does. So now you're, you, you're done with this. You got the DVD, which is highly recommended. Who is Harry Nilsson? Now, do you take a break before you jump into the next project, or do you just have to continually churn and burn and work? Well, I interestingly enough, this was essentially finished uh, a few years ago, and we played a couple of festivals, and we just had some, some licensing issues that delayed it, it coming out. So um, subsequent to this, so we made the U.S. versus John Lennon. Which is great. Thank you. Uh, the Night James Brown Saved Boston. Mm -hmm. J John Scheinfeld, who, who uh, not only wrote and directed Harry, but was the one who never gave up, who kept pushing no matter how much rejection Bravo. we got. He, he was just, uh, he, he was, he was a, a bull in the china shop to, to make sure that uh, this film got finished and out. Um, he made a movie about the Chicago Cubs, kind of a lovable losers movie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, one of the things that uh, that uh, was great about making documentaries is it allowed me to go back to what I wanted to do originally, which was write movies, and walk in and say, okay, I know how to tell a story now. Here's a script about whomever. And so some of the people who we've made documentaries about uh, have been working on uh, feature scripts about on like, right. like Groucho Marx, for example. Oh, Groucho Marx movie? Yeah. Oh, I'm first in line for that. Groucho's a, I, yeah. he's like, he's amazing. He's like, Groucho's the best. He sort of invented comedy. Oh, yeah. yeah. For I the sound era. For the yes. sound era. The sound yes. era, yeah. And I didn't realize, I just read this. I'm sure you probably know this because you're a big Groucho fan. I didn't realize that Billy Wilder was working on a film, a Groucho Marx, a Marx Brothers film that was going to take place in the U.N. It was in 1960-61. They, they were supposedly working on something. Not, uh, 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 Billy Wilder's writing partner, as you know, uh, Izzy Diamond, mm -hmm. his son is, is, is a friend of mine. Oh, and, wow. Oh, really? And a, 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 he, he and I actually... I have been looking at the the notes from that. The, the, the story is is that Billy Wilder and 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 Diamond were on a plane coming back from New York, and there was every there was traffic everywhere, and they're kind of sitting on the ground at at, at what was then Idlewild Airport in New York, now JFK. And why the delay? Well, all these Russian and communist diplomats are in town, and there's all this security. Wouldn't this be a funny place to? put a Marx Brothers movie. Hmm. And it actually progressed. It, it, it wasn't just a notion. Uh, Wilder called Groucho, and Groucho said, you know, for anybody else, the answer would be no, but for you, yes. And, and they were going to do it. And then Chico had a heart attack and was uninsurable. And it, and it never happened. Wow. And, and you have you have notes of these script notes or just story beats? We have or? some story beats that were. Interesting. Uh, it's kind of the gr it's both the both. Write the down my email. Thank <laughs> <laughs> the great it's the great lost Marx Brothers movie and the great lost oh. Billy Wilder. Uh, yeah. Story. Oh, can you imagine? Wow. Billy Go Wilder. Back in time. Billy Wilder. Fifty doing years a Marx later. Brothers if, film. if that had happened. I would say buy it. <laughs> on Byron. And Paul, don't be mad at me for for talking about this, but he brought it up. Right. Okay. So That's here we great. go. So, um, we got questions from the room. Oh, we got questions from yeah. the room. Yeah. I was about to plug the DVD. Um, Who is Harry Nielsen? A couple of these. Let's see. Um, Lady Diode asked, maybe, I don't know if it's a Marx brother, uh, Groucho Marx or not. Is one particular artist you're just waiting to do a film on? There, there are a, a number of musical artists who I want to do a f films, whether it's scripted or d uh, documentary. Uh, Stevie Wonder, Paul McCartney, Elton John, Billy Joel. I've been wanting to do a Rufus Wainwright film. Hmm. He's my f he's my favorite 21st century songwriter. You were talking before about 
where do people in the music business fit in yeah. differently than they might have 40 years ago? Ruf Rufus is kind of a throwback. He went yeah. through some kind of terrible 20s and of some self-destructive behavior, and he's come out on the other side and is continuing to produce great work. Fascinating. Um, from, a, from a scripted point of view, uh, Groucho is certainly at the top of the list, and then I have a, a rock and roll conspiracy movie that I'd like to see get made. And may you make all of them. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> what else, Mike? Um, Skillas from the chat room asks, uh, what other artists like Nilsson would you recommend to people who, that uh, would you suggest people don't know about but they really should? Uh, oh, boy. Mm. Um, in that era, I guess. Well, any, any, I guess any artist, you know. Well, Ruf kind of, Ruf kind of Rufus Wainwright is somebody who I don't think has gotten the kind of attention right. he should have given his talent. I, I think he's the best songwriter, uh, best contemporary songwriter going. Um, did, did you find it strange that they uh, they closed the Liberace Museum? <laughs> <laughs> you know, they closed the Liberace Museum, and you're like... Did you ever drive by it? <coughs> no, I, I... You would never go in. I mean, you, you drive by it. Like it's in a strip mall, uh, and, and it's, there's nothing really enticing about it. But he was so famous when he was alive. He was Liberace, right? Piano and the thing and the candelabras and the, 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 the capes, whatever. And now it's like he dies. He's still Liberace, and then they, take a, they, they dismantle this one thing that you thought would live forever. So when Liberace was on his death, at least I have my museum. People it, will always know about me. Oh, it, who, swing and a miss. Who's, gonna, who's making a movie starring as Liberace? You would think they would have wanted to... Uh, that's, been, that's been on the books for a long time. That's never gotten... Was it Michael got a Douglas? Of, or? A lot of yeah. false starts. Mm -hmm. But you would have thought they, it would have been worth it to them to keep the, move, the museum that's open. Right. Yeah. Um, Although, I could see in the Liberace film, the very first scene will be the dismantling of the Liberace, the building that it's in. They take like a big wrecking ball and they yeah, why destroy not? the museum. And wow, why tragic not? story. This guy's uh, his legacy is gone now. And then they go, you know, cut back forty years. Write that down. <laughs> a couple more questions. And to answer and, and to answer no. the, the the person who wanted to know more about Harry Nilsson, from his era, people like Randy Newman, Van Dyke Parks, Jimmy Webb, uh, Lowell George, and Little Feet, people who who kind of had their moments in the sun and maybe are worthy of, 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 a, of a deeper look. Really, so great songwriters is, is always my focus. Um, I know you sort of answered this with the DVD. Uh, Jamal Fox asks, what parts of the doc were cut that you'd like to have kept in? Which then I guess probably showed up on the DVD. A really actually, uh, I, I would say the director and I, uh, I didn't fight him on it too much because he worked so damn hard to make everything happen. But I think the movie could have been a little bit shorter. <laughs> um, as it is, so I, there's nothing. There's nothing in the bonus material that really needs to be. There's so, there's just so much of it. I mean, Harry Nilsson wrote a song that Phil Spector produced and took mm. a co-writing credit on, and we don't even mention that in the movie. Um, if I have my facts straight, I think both Mama Cass and Keith Moon no both died in his apartment <laughs> in London. I mean, not not a mention of it. I mean, there's wow. there's just so wow. many sidebars that, that we didn't have time to go into. Hmm. Harry Nilsson is somebody who you should go by the first, yeah. say, six or seven the albums. Of rock and roll right there. Hmm. It kind of connects in, it seems like, you know, with his life. Yeah. Kind of all the, all the rock and rollers, you know, if you're talking about Cass and Keith Moon, all these connections of, of, John of, Lennon. That, of that generation, yeah, certainly. Sure. Hmm. Um, and SFM Corey, uh, any interesting revelations that came out while you reviewed the footage? So something you might have not known about. That sort of came out as you're reviewing, I, I, looking for. I have to say this: this, unlike most of the other documentaries we've done, this was almost constant revelation, because until people sit across from you and, and tell you these stories, you you have no, there's no way you would know it. You hear it, you hear that he's crazy, you hear that he's wild, but when you sit across from Paul Williams or Jimmy Webb or Danny Hutton from Three Dog Night. And they're telling you the, these much larger than life stories. Mickey Dolenz tells a story about you know Harry calling him from the emergency room and picking him up, and you know Harry saying, "Well, make sure you bring a bottle of this and a pack of cigarettes." And you were asking before about did his friend mm -hmm. stop him, and Mickey goes, "I didn't bring the cigarettes." You know? <laughs> that was brand, wasn't a brandy you wanted him to bring. Yeah, brandy. I'm, I'm, he bought the brandy. He brought the he brought the yes. brandy. Yes. <laughs> I didn't realize that Harry had written one. one yes, the loneliest number. He he, uh, you know, th this is where art is is so incredible. He's got a busy signal on the phone. You couldn't get a busy signal really mm. anymore. Who do you know who doesn't have call waiting? Yeah. And he hears the 
beep, 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 and he stayed with the busy. One is the lo He just wrote the song listening to the busy signal. Now, that's a, that's a song that he records. Danny Hutton, who was uh, obsessed with finding great songs for Three Dog Night to, to record, hears it, and they turn it into a number one record. I mean, it, it was a... The, the music community is always small. And I don't think that's any different than today. Everyone kind of knows everybody. They run into each other. Hey, I got a song you should record. Yeah. Who's the guy? Bruno, um, who was just on Saturday Night Live. Was it Bruno Mars? Mm -hmm. Bruno Mars. Oh, yeah. Just incredible, incredibly mm. uh, young songwriter artist. Mm. And he's standing there. He looked like Elvis Presley on the Ed Sullivan show. Like, I know this is my moment. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I think great artists come along all the time. I think what happens in, in our in our v too fast world, we eat them up and spit them out a lot faster. That's a good Even point. Even though they used to have to work more. That's a good point. People just, you get sick of them faster for whatever We're reason. We're exposed to them more there there are everywhere you go you can download songs you can you can hear them you hear everything i mean we consume media all day long every day so we used to you know more radio stations more television stations it's easier to get overexposed mm -hmm. for sure and yet thanks to the internet we happen to know that a little movie called who is, who harry, is nelson? harry nelson is available on dvd <laughs> ladies and gentlemen yeah. david lee and we'll, Thank uh, you. we'll be sure to that up on our sites as well. We're going to put this segment up on YouTube and on Blip, and we'll include a link that will take you right to Amazon so people can buy this easily. And we'll have it up on the site, right? Awesome. Thank, Amazon, you. Guessing, yeah. thank you. There you go, David. David thank you, thank you, thank you, very you much. so much. Buy, rent, or burn. Oh, buy. are you kidding? <laughs> buy it. Gotta buy this thing. Come okay. on. Why would we have you on unless it was a buy? No Brent for you. <laughs> We're going whole hog on the buy. There it is. Good. Yes. Try Cast Remedy. Okay, so uh, David, thank you. Thank now Thank you very much. All right, so here's the situation. So far, in the year of our Lord, 2010, it's been a good year for documentaries, right? Yeah. You got uh, Casino Jack and the United States of Money. You got Client 9 coming out. Got a lot of good documentaries. Tillman Story. Got Tillman Story, which, is, which will Film win the Oscar. Film and Finished, which is great. Yeah. But I'll tell you something. I watched this uh, documentary here. Who is Harry Nilsson? It's right here. And why is everybody talking about him? Because Harry Nilsson, it turns out, is a really interesting guy. Fascinating. And the producer of the uh, documentary, is here, David Leaf is right here. Now, before we bring him on, yes. we want to show you a clip from the movie, Who is Harry Nilsson? Roll it. Everybody's talking at me. I don't hear words they're saying. Only the echoes of my mind. So when you say Harry Nilsson, everybody's like, no, Harry Nilsson, either they, they get it right away or they have no idea. Nominations had come out, album of the year, record of the year. Best male vocal performance, best engineered record, whatever category it could have been nominated, it was nominated. Love and start at the lead in the measure, each step is a pleasure, each night is adventure, each morning was something that had to be shared together. He spent most of his life in pursuit of a good time, and he caught it, and uh, it caught him in the end. I defer, Harry. Man, I don't know how far you want me to go with this. David Leaf, hey. everybody, Thank come you. on! Thank Give you. it up for him, the producer of Who is Harry Nilsson. By the way, this documentary is fantastic. Thank terrific. you. Terrific. Thank you. you. Know? Really terrific. And what I love about documentaries like this is it takes a guy who you don't know that much about, right? A guy who had the one hit. You know, he sang the song from Midnight. The more I, I the more we knew that this was a character who who had a had an arc, a tragic arc. But, but an incredible story that nobody knew. Uh, and we've really only got to the tip of the iceberg of it in the, in the film. But uh, Nilsson is really just one of those nobody knows who he is, and the moment you hear his voice, you go, oh, that's the guy. Yeah. Do you, do you feel like his career actually was not as big as it should have been? Um, it seems that Harry Nilsson was quite determined not to have a big career. He, he, he essentially is the textbook example of how to both not be successful and how to self-destruct at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, he, and, and this, will, this uh, as this is a movie show, I'll use a, a strange movie analogy. 
I think in, in my amateur psychological analysis of it is that it came so easily. dialing a telephone, I got a busy signal, and it was going beep, 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 and just wrote beep, it on the beep, phone. Beep, beep. One is the loneliest number that you'll ever do. He just came on the scene, you know, blasted onto the scene, and he just started influencing people. I'm sure he influenced the Beatles as much as the Beatles influenced him. Beatles is my favorite group. The Beatles endorsed Harry. Pronounced him to the world and said, listen to this man. I thought to myself, this song really has the potential to be like a little animated cartoon. So I said, why don't you try using different voices? Think of the doctor saying, now let me get this straight. You put the lime in the coconut. Put the lime in the coconut, you drink them both up. Put the lime in the coconut, you drink them both up. While we were in Japan, the cowboy, and that's really all you know about him in a sense. And then you watch a film like this and you realize he had, he was so influential. He wrote all these other songs you didn't know about. You know, how much did you know about him going in? Well, I knew a lot about Harry uh, before we started making the movie because in a lot of the other documentaries I'd, I'd made and a lot of the other work I've done, um, I have a whole separate career in music television series like uh, Live by Request or the Billboard Awards or all sorts of music specials. Uh, and my favorite people to work with are always songwriters because to me songwriters are the ones who are kind of touched by God and, or whatever spirit you believe in. And they, they hear it and then they give it to us and if, mm. if it hits you hard, it's like falling in love. And, and Harry Nilsson was one of those guys that so many people who I was working with always talked about as a friend, a colleague, somebody whose career they really admired. And, and the more uh, stories I heard about him, 